Before I go to Dilip, uh, let me just say that I was a student here a long time ago from 81 till 85. Uh, then I worked in Engineers India Limited uh, in New Delhi. Uh, it's a petrochemical uh, organization for design of the whole, whole petrochemical plant. So I had, I had really nice exposure working in many design problems. After working for about one and a half to a couple of, couple of years, I decided to go for higher studies. Then I moved to US and did my master's and PhD. But then I wanted to come back and, and, and practice my teaching career here. So I joined IIT Kanpur because Kharagpur had a lot of nice memories for uh, my being here as a student and I didn't want to spoil it. So I, I went to a different place. Um, but I enjoyed my stay in Kanpur. Uh, there are a lot of um, uh, you know, nice uh, facilities over there and the students. Uh, very dedicated students, which uh, I had the opportunity to work with. Uh, so I spent about 20 years working there before moving to US only about four years ago. So, um, so uh, I, I'm basically an Indian and just recently moved out. So I'm happy that there is this scheme for me to come back and do something for India. So I'll be keep on coming, hopefully, every year, at least for a couple of weeks. But it's, it's getting a bit of a crunch of time. Uh, because that's really my main place now. And I have about 11 PhD students and three postdocs. So, so many people and so many other activities, projects that I have, it's very difficult to take two weeks out. But in the summer, I have you know, told myself that I have to do this. I have to come for two weeks. So, I keep aside everything and come for it. So, please try to take uh, you know, good, good uh, stock of the time. And let us make it interactive. Uh, my purpose would, would be not to finish all the thing you have here in the proceedings. Um, this I've just kept in case there is no question, no interaction. I'll just go and do my job and, and go back. Okay? But even if I spend half of it, you ask me so many questions that I have the chance to do only half, I will be most happy person. right? So the idea would be to, to, for you to understand at least few things that I, that I put over here. Um, Coming back to Dilip, uh, he, I mentioned, uh, was my first PhD student. And then uh, he had an illustrious career working at various places, eventually um, being here for quite some time now. He had his promotions very quickly because of his work. And he's got quite many students uh, been working on, on, on PhD. So um, he's been also doing optimization and multi-agent systems quite a bit. He's written quite a few books in this. Um, but um, uh, this course, mostly uh, since I'm doing it for the first time, uh, Dilip and I, I decided to do most of the teaching myself. And then one of the days, uh, he's going to talk about interactive uh, and visualization methods for optimization, which is also a very important thing. All right, so here are email addresses for both of us. So uh, you, have the, you have the proceedings and, and you have all these things. The way I would suggest you to do is, um, you will have this with you, right, by the time you leave. So keep all your notes onto this. There are white spaces around. So keep all the notes around it. So don't keep it in some other place so that everything is here. And don't ever lose it, OK? Keep it all the way till you need it. All right, so um, moving to the next slide. Mm. What's happening? OK. Um, let's just go through the general structure of the whole course. Uh, today is little exception because we had the inauguration and we started a little late. One thing I would like to ta uh, look at is that I saw some of you came 10, 15 minutes later uh, than when it's supposed to be. So let's not do that from now on uh, because we have limited time. Uh, so 9.30 we're going to start. Please come at least 5 or 10 minutes before and wait outside in case you have to so that as soon as it's 9.30 we can start. Okay. Um, and then in the afternoon, we're going to start at 2 to, uh, uh, to, to 3.30. Uh, we'll be solving problems in the, in the afternoon. And the assignment problems are, I think, given at the back uh, most of the days. Uh, if there's any change, I'm going to let you know. So the way we'll do that is uh, I will briefly explain before you start doing the assignments of what you should do. And the assignments will be based on what we cover either that day morning or the previous days. So you'll have exposure to the material for doing the home assignments, uh, sorry, the, 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 uh, the assignments here. And if you cannot solve it for some reason, I will ask you to take it home 
home means to wherever you're staying here and next day you can bring it so you need to submit um, you need to submit the assignments on a piece of paper which you're not providing so you have to have your own papers to work on them you can use your pen and pen or pencil need not have to be typed or anything okay so when you submit them um, today there is an exception again uh, we are going to start at 3 p.m. Uh, instead of 2 p.m. today okay so because we are a little late and I need to leave at 12 uh, for another appointment but uh, uh, so 3 o'clock only exception today but tomorrow onwards we will we will start at 2 p.m. so we'll go from 3 to 4 30 today I hope it's okay with everybody right so in the same room uh, there are four quizzes we are not going to take any more final exam okay so it's a continuous evaluation because if a final exam means you will only look at before the exam and that's not going to serve the purpose so I thought of distributing it so take each quiz very seriously because that goes towards your evaluation okay again any change I'm going to mention to you so this slide you don't have because I just added today but this is just for you I thought I should have a one slide on the objectives of this course so this there are a few objectives that we have so that you are you see where we are going first of all you will understand what is the scope of optimization in practice so why is optimization needed what are the problems in practice where optimization is needed uh, both professor Saha and Das talked about in the inauguration about the importance of it uh, I will show you a, a laundry list of various problems uh, one of the thing with optimization is that there is no boundary there is no discipline where it belongs okay I had my formal training in, opti in mechanical engineering but there are optim I get students from computer science I get students from aerospace from business school actually so I, I do such a course in, in university in a university in Finland called Alto University uh, it's actually Alto University School of Business uh, although there is engineering school but business school thought their students should uh, should know optimization just this summer it's not yet finished uh, last couple of weeks I have been video shooting on an MBA course on um, uh, where a module is the optimization module that is an MSU course it will be an online course but unfortunately uh, you know you will not have access to that because this is a proprietary thing but the, the, the why I'm telling you is that this is not only restricted to engineering uh, we optimize in many different problems problem areas so you'll get a good idea of the scope so I want you to understand that because many of you will be eventually working in a company or will become a professor and you will maybe coming from different backgrounds different fields uh, optimization is one common thing that binds all of us you'll see so I want you to understand that then um, there will be certain properties that the corresponding optimal solution will have and it's good to understand what are these properties because many people in industry don't know that many people uh, many students even who has not taken a course like this uh, know that so they think okay I have used a code downloaded from somewhere and I have applied into my problem and I got a solution that must be the optimal solution but no optimal solutions have certain properties so we'll go through them unfortunately those properties are mathematical properties okay fortunately or unfortunately unfortunately I say because many of you may not be very math savvy sh uh, maybe liking math too much so that's why I say unfortunate but you need to know for those of you need to know a little bit of math but it's not a very high-fi math your 12th standard math is good enough like how to compute gradients hope you remember uh, I'll try to keep it restricted to polynomials so that you want to get the idea and not really do research and optimization from today um, and a little bit of geometry which I'm going to be talking about a little more so not much is needed here but you cannot avoid um, math and a little bit of geometry unless uh, in, you know if you want to understand what makes the solutions optimal so that's something I want you to know I don't want you to know them as very descriptive uh, course okay there should be some um, something finite and something that is more definitive uh, then the third point I want you to understand the certain methods of doing optimization there are codes we are trying to see if uh, okay how many of you have your own laptop here okay about 50 not even 50 percent okay we are trying to see if the computer system that they have there can be used so if it is then uh, then we will go through some MATLAB experience of doing optimization if not uh, then those of you have laptops you can bring it 
on the next week, the following week when we get there. Uh, I will otherwise demonstrate it on my computer. So when you go back to, you, to your uh, place and uh, you have an access to computer, you can, and if you have MATLAB, you can do it. But at least I want you to understand some of the optimization methods. So that's not a mandatory thing. There won't be any quiz questions from MATLAB or anything, but this is for you to know. Um, and then the fourth thing I want you to know is understand their role, the optimization role for finding stuff that goes beyond just the optimal solution. So, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the name of the course has this word innovation in it. I want you to think that you can innovate. All you need to know is now who is going to guide me, what kind of methodologies. Do I have a textbook by which I can learn how to innovate? Unfortunately, there is no such book yet. But I strongly feel it's a possibility. We can teach how to do innovation. And innovation is everything these days. Any company you join, uh, any place you work, unless you're innovating, um, you are nobody. Um, you, need, you don't need masters and PhD students uh, unless you can innovate. Uh, everybody can be done with polytechnic background or at most a bachelor's degree background if you want to do just run of the mill stuff. But they hire graduate students thinking that they will come up with new ideas. So where does the ideas come from? You are, you are designing, you're working in a company. The company produces something, let's say gearbox, every day. So how are you going to design something new? Well, all you are taught in your undergraduation, if, you, if that's the only degree you have, is how to design a gearbox. It doesn't tell you how to come up with a new gearbox, which may be better in terms of compactness, in terms of its performance, noise free. There are different things you can have, but you're not exposed to those things. So you wonder, uh, how am I going to design something new, right? And that's a common question that only undergrads have. So this is a motivation for those of you who are just working on your bachelors to think about doing higher studies, because higher studies means masters and PhD provides you a unique platform to specialize on certain areas, right? And there you are not taught exactly how to design a gearbox in any way, but you are trained. Your brain is kind of nurtured in that direction to start thinking in a new way, okay? So there are methodologies to do that. And hopefully in this course, you will get some of that exposure, okay? But it will not be enough for you to start innovating, but this is just an exposure. You still need the domain background. So you still need your, if you're a naval, naval architecture student, you need that background. If you're aerospace students, you need that background. But you need additionally more that can only come from your master's and PhD program, okay? So hopefully you'll get a flavor of that. Uh, I think you'll have enough information for you to know some of these things and go back and say, okay, I'm working on these things, either on my PhD topic, and here is something, I want to create something new. Um, he told us a few things, so, so it could be a good start for you to get a hold of a software, get a hold of a method, and get some new concepts from, from this course. So that's my objective of this course that, that we'll have. Prerequisite, as I said, again, this one you don't have, uh, but if you want, you can note it down. Um, you need to know gradient, gradient a little bit, as I mentioned, um, the 2D geometry a little bit. Uh, if I give you a function of x, y, can you plot it? that kind of geometry knowledge, okay? Any programming knowledge will be great, but in this course, I had a talk with Dilip uh, before framing this course, and he told me that getting computer may be a little difficulty, so I didn't put that part here, but now we are seeing some opportunities, so next time I do, I'll probably put more uh, programming into the course, but uh, this course, you're not doing it, so you, you need not have to know, but if you know any programming language, that's going to be helpful, because some of the algorithms we are ta we're talking about, you can in the evening sit in your hostel room and try to code it, you know, and then see what's happening. So I, I, I think you try to utilize your time the maximum uh, by going through the material in the evenings because you have the material with you, just revising through. The best idea would be if two or three of you are staying in one place, two or three of you go together in the evening time, after dinner time, just go over the slides of today, of what you have done, and if there's any question, you note it down and you ask me the next day, right? So that's how you can, we can get the best out of it. Okay, let's make a very quick rundown of the things. So today I'm going to start with what is optimization? What is its scope in practice? Uh, the time we have, we may not be able to finish everything, but I will skip it over uh, for, for tomorrow. 
Um, I briefly mentioned in my inauguration is that um, there is a, there are a lot of myths in industry about the use of optimization is practice. So I want to say why they think this way. What are we doing to change this? So, um, so some of those we'll just go through. I'll probably not able to go to the no freelance theorem, but we'll see. It's it's something that always uh, keeps us in the right track. Okay, it's called no free lunch theorem. Um, I will mention it when I more when I get to that that point. But this is a guiding factor that any optimization researcher these days get guided by. So you are taking the course should also know about it. So we'll we'll talk about it when you get there. And then I'm going to be told, there's a spelling mistake here, but um, on optimization, the steps of optimization methods. And in the exercise today, we're going to, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, problems to formulate the problems as an optimization problem. And I'll be there to guide you, but I want you to first try yourself. Okay, tomorrow, we're going to talk about single variable constra unconstrained optimization. First, I'll start with some optimality conditions, and then I'll talk about few um, algorithms that are classically motivated. Um, although I'm using the word here classical, they are not dead, okay? They are still used, because sometimes we think classical means gone past, but no. Uh, uh, the, the, the reason I want to say classical is we're going to come back with some non-classical methods which are really fast taking over the optimization problems and solving. Um, and, and, and those are like population-based methods, which I'm going to be talking about think from to the, towards the later part of this week or early next week, probably later part of this week. We'll, we'll just see that. Um, but classical methods are mostly point-based methods. So I'm going to uh, you know, differentiate the two methods, classical versus non-classical, and we'll go over that. But initially, I would like you to have the idea of the, how the whole optimization started, okay? and then what are the new stuff that will come later. So we'll start again very gently with single variable, just only one variable, so you understand everything about what is an optimization problem? What are the optimal proper properties of optimal solutions? And what are some algorithms, which are very easy to understand? Then we move to multivariable. Now we'll have multidimensional space. We, we can visualize up to three dimensions, but we'll go beyond three. We'll actually talk about two or three, but then extend it for higher dimensions. So you can see how, how things change, like how the, how the optimality conditions change, and how the algorithms have to be changed as well. Again, I will stay ourselves with the classical methods. Then we'll become a bit more um, challenging, and we'll talk about constrained optimization. First two topics will be unconstrained. Again, optimality conditions, duality theory that comes uh, very handy uh, for solving constraint problems. So I'm just going to introduce you to that. OK. Um, and then the tomorrow's assignment will be on those topics. So there will be a little bit of math for tomorrow's Tomorrow's, class, tomorrow's exercise problem, manual calculations. On Wednesday, uh, we'll talk about constraint algorithms. Okay, And then there is a very important post-optimality analysis, uh, which, which again can provide you knowledge about your problem. That's called the sensitivity analysis. So we'll talk about that. Then we'll talk about a series of structured programming, structured optimization algorithms, starting with linear programming then quadratic programming, then integer programming. Has any of you done linear programming before, LP? Yeah, it comes in very various different courses, particularly if you're from IME, industrial management. Um, you are, you have to take such a course or, on operations research. Uh, so optimization is a bit more generic than just operations research. We cover both linear and nonlinear. But operations research field mostly talks about linear programming and to some extent quadratic programming. Okay? So we'll, we'll start with those there and then move to integer programming. And then um, the, on those topics, there will be the exercise. Uh, since, since it's one and a half hour, the, the quiz would be about half the time, let's say 40 minutes, 45 minutes. So we will, I will give you less problems for, the, for these topics, and we'll keep 45 minutes for the quiz. Then on Thursday, so first quiz we have is on Wednesday, okay? But everything on that quiz will be covered, at least what we do today and tomorrow and the morning of Wednesday. So, um, but I'll try to make it more from the days before that we do that. Um, then we'll start the, oh, so we're starting population based on Thursday already, okay? And then we'll talk about genetic algorithms, which is one of the ways to do non-classical optimization. 
we'll start with the simplest one called the binary code of GA and then how to handle constraints and some case studies and there is a little bit of theory called schema theorem which we'll talk about exercises will be on the integer programming that we did a, that we did the day before and binary coded GA that we'll be doing the same day then on Friday we'll go a little more advanced talk about real coded GA which is a bit more advanced from binary coded GA then there are a few other real coded um, optimization population based optimization like differential evolution particle swarm and evolution strategies. These are some of the methods that are quite popularly used these days. Um, then I will start the introduction of practicalities that we often face in real world problems. One of the things is meta modeling, which we will talk to you then when I get there. Right now I am just telling you some of the topics. So again the exercise will be on what we covered the previous day up to that day. Okay? And there will be a quiz on genetic algorithm on Friday. So this week we have two quizzes one on Wednesday, one on Friday. Then we don't have any class on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, and then Monday, Dilip is going to take uh, the class on interactive evolutionary algorithms and scheduling evolutionary algorithms. And there will be exercise on those problems. I believe the, the day six exercise is not in the proceeding. So he is probably going to give you on that day itself. Okay, then day seven I come back and on Tuesday, that's Tuesday and we start with large scale optimization. Uh, you will be the first timer where I will present a billion variable optimization algorithm. Um, so far the optimization has been practiced since early 60s, actually from about second world war. Uh, nobody has solved such a big problem. So this actually takes us a leap forward showing that optimization can be used for very large scale problems because this, this had been a question to me from various fields, various people asking me how big a problem have you solved? So this actually answers them that yeah we can go up to billion variable but to solve a billion variable problem there are a lot of hurdles. So we'll, I'm going to go over it so that you see what it takes to solve a large scale problem. And then we'll stay with multimodal optimization where there are multiple optimal solutions. Oftentimes we have that in practice that a design is good for a number of different ways. Number of different designs can be equally good. So how can you find all of them? Or how can you find, let's say, four or five of them or ten of them? So that now you can decide which one to put. Uh, so that comes under this multimodal optimization. So up to that point, uh, we'll be covering single objective, finding one solution, one optimal solution. And we should be happy till that point. Now we are getting more and more challenging and we are saying, no, we are not happy with one. If there are multiple solutions, give me number of solutions. I want to see if a gearbox loop like this, is there another gearbox giving me the same kind of compactness, but looks different. So I'm being a designer. I'm interested in seeing different solutions before I make up my mind which one to do. There are a lot of advantages, other advantages. Like if you are particularly, let's say, a practitioner and the lead company in that particular area you can fool your competitor. As soon as you come up with new products, uh, there are industries, there are companies who try to mimic you. They try to do reverse engineering, figure out how you're solving problems, and they come up with a mimicry of your solutions, right? And they try to s sell it cheap. Oftentimes it happens. Um, but if you're the leader, and if you know multiple solutions to solve the same problem, you can fool them by every couple of months, come up with a new design. And a lot of industries do that. Right? And then your competitors or your uh, followers just have no clue. How are they doing all this? Okay? So when you have multimodal optimization, you learn that there exist number of designs having very similar performances. And since you found them, you can switch it. You can switch from one to the other just to confuse your competitors. So there are a lot of uh, advantages. But again, it all goes back to knowledge. As soon as you find multiple solutions that are equally good, Think about how much knowledge you can learn from all those solutions. So this course is not only about finding one optimal solutions, knowing some algorithms for this, which many course will have, but I want to also want to stress on learning something from it, learning knowledge uh, discovery out of the problem. Then we'll move to another very important area, hierarchical optimization, uh, which has a special name when you have two hierarchy called bi-level. And this is really taking shape. And in my lab uh, back home is um, one of the 
one of the places where we are leading in this area. We started a lot of work about seven, eight years ago. Now we've got about four PhD students working on it. Um, so if you Google on bi-level, you'll have to come back to our site because most, most of the stuff we are doing. Uh, so we'll, I would like to give you an introduction to that hierarchical optimization. Again, exercises will be on those topics. Wednesday, we'll go to even more practical stuff called multi-objectives. Just outside at the, at the coffee break, uh, I was talking to Professor Shah and Das again. And they mentioned about, without my mentioning, they said that practice is full of conflicting objectives, competing objectives. Uh, yes, they are. And then we have ways to handle them. So we'll talk about multi-objective. This is something I championed started when I was in Kanpur, back in 93. As soon as I joined with my first master's degree student, I took this up as a how to, get, how to solve this multi-objective problem, so more than 20 years ago. And now uh, this has become a field. Industries have graduated from single object to multi-objective. And many of the industries use our algorithms. Uh, algorithm we are going to be talking about called NSGA2. Maybe some of you have heard, may not be. But uh, this is one of the, um, one of the algorithms that has made uh, multi-objective optimization not only popular, but useful in industry. And all these were developed while I was in Kanpur with students like you. Okay? So it's, it's possible to do. That single paper of NSJ2, just to tell you how popular it is, has got now, I think about 18,000 Google Scholar citations, just one paper. So you can, uh, you can think of the popularity of multi-objective optimization in practice. And I am particularly consultant of few industries and software industries, which does optimization software. They have their annual uh, meetings, right, called, called users group meetings. Uh, every time I go, every year I go, I see that they first only doing single objective, then move to two and three objectives. And from last year on, I've seen some of them using five, six objectives. But we will talk about in this course some algorithms which can do about 15 or 20 objectives. Okay? Industries are not ready yet, but um, I think in a few years they are going to be there. And in my lab, we've started talking about 50 plus objectives. So there are problems which requires that many objectives. It's just a matter of time. Uh, industries is funny. Uh, they closely follow what goes on. Um, they will watch. Okay, so many industries, just the day before I came, uh, there was a company called me and said, we're looking for solving about 11 objectives, 11 to 12 objectives they have, and they couldn't find anybody else to do it. So they bumped into our website and they thought they called me to find out. I said, yeah, we have methods. We can solve 15 to 20 objectives. And then they wanted to discuss further. I said, OK, two weeks, I'll not be here. Uh, I said, after two weeks, uh, we come back and talk about it. But they cannot wait. You see how much sacrifice I'm making, right, for you guys. So you have to, you have to really pay it back uh, somehow um, by paying attention of what we'll be doing and going through all this. So they, they cannot wait because. Um, they also work on deadlines. And they just came to know that we can handle so many objectives which they have been looking for. Okay? So now they want to do this first shot to see what are different solutions to this problem that they're interested in. So industries are catching up very quickly. As soon as they, so if they don't find anything, they will say, okay, maybe the academics is not ready yet. But as soon as they find something, they will say, oh, here's the guy who can do it. And they will immediately jump into it. So in academics, we always try to keep ourselves ahead of what the practice is so that they get ideas. They can get into new things that, uh, that they may not be doing. But I know, well, as soon as I talk about optimization and multi-objective optimization, you will see what is the importance of having so many objectives. It just opens up another complete, uh, you know, another door for optimization. So there is another issue with the optimization is decision making because by default, when you have multiple objectives, it gives you a number of solutions. So then the decision making becomes an important issue. So we are, we are working on some of those. And I'm going to give you some introduction to that. This literature is far from being complete. Okay, A lot of research still going on in this. So this is a very fertile area. The whole slide here is a fertile area to work on. So there will be exercises on these uh, algorithms so that you can uh, practice yourself also a little bit. Then Thursday, we're going to talk about performance measures. Because these are new, you will not be able to hear from too many people about this. So I decided to talk a couple of days on the multi-objective optimization. Uh, and it is also 
very much like research type of ideas. So many of you, I think, are graduate students right here. So if you're looking for a new topic to work on or, or at least know so that you may be well advanced in your thesis and think of, OK, after I finish my thesis, I'm looking for ideas. So these are some of the things you can go get, get into. Um, so this innovation I mentioned, which we're going to be talking about in, in a little bit of depth. And you'll see what I mean by knowledge discovery. Uh, with the availability of parallel computers these days, um, uh, you need algorithms, optimization algorithms that can use take help of parallel computing or distributed computing. So I'm going to show you some ideas of how to do it. OK, then this is the time when I was looking for a computer. Each of you should have. Uh, but we'll see if we, all of you don't have it, we cannot arrange the computer system downstairs. Then I'm going to just demonstrate here. And, and those of you can bring your laptop, can bring it. And I can give you those codes, and you can try. Um, last class will be Friday, 8th July. Uh, we'll talk about these many objectives, going over to 15 plus objectives, and then few other practicalities, like uncertainty handling, which is a very practical thing. Again, I'm not going to describe today all of those. Dynamic optimization, where as you're optimizing, your objective, prop, objective function and constraints change with time. So, so you need to always trace back where the optimum is. Uh, then multimodal, multi-objective optimization. We'll see how much time we have with, uh, with this last day. Uh, but I would like to definitely show you a 14 objective application, which you have recently done from New Zealand. It's a land use management problem. So we'll see that. And then I'll wrap up. There won't be any exercise that day, OK? Because we'll just, we'll just finish uh, after, after the morning session that day. OK, so uh, and there is no final exam. OK, so there will be four quizzes. I forgot to mention the quizzes this week, right? Do I have it here? OK, I don't have it here. But uh, there is one I mentioned on 1st July. But there should be, so that's the first this week. There should be two more. And I have another, another scheduled place I'm going to show you. So there will be two more uh, next week, OK? So uh, attendance will be 20%. There is a uh, paper that's uh, floating around. So please put your name and sign there so that uh, we know the attendance. Um, there will be nine exercises in total, right? Except the last day, and we will just take the best eight out of it. So one you can uh, afford to do not good, but others you try to do good. So and that will carry about thirty percent, and quizzes will be fifty percent because that's how we get the individual assessment of you. So I keep a little more weightage for that. Okay. Any question about the organization of the course or anything that you? expected to learn from these courses which I haven't covered here. No? OK, you can, you can ask me any time. Stop me any time as we go along. OK, so I don't save it here. Now we start with the first lecture. Um, because we started a little late, I'm not going to give you any break today. We'll just go. So it's just another, another hour and 10 minutes. So. I can do that. Um, OK. So what I'm going to do is talk to you about what is optimization. Scope of optimization is practi in practice, variations of different kinds of optimization problems that we face in practice. And if time permits today, which I don't think, but we'll see if we talk about no free lunch theorem. OK, any of you has taken, taken optimization class before? Any optimization class? OK, there are four of you. Are you from here or Karakpur or no other places? OK. So was it a full course on optimization, or is it embedded in some other course? Genetic algorithm. You took a genetic algorithm course. How about you? OK. And over here? I learned it from online courses. Online courses you have done. You? Same online course. Operations, Operations research, research and optimization. What would you? OK. Operations research, there is some optimization, right? But mostly linear and quadratic, yeah. right? OK, but majority of you didn't have an exposure. So let, I will start as knowing as if none of you know optimization, OK? So first, um, we need to go back many, many years before we want to trace back who was doing optimization at the earliest. And I found in 300 BC, OK, Euclid was talking about finding the word, this word minimal. Anything you see, the minimization or maximization, this is a 
generic, uh, the generic word for these is called optimization. Okay? Uh, the optimum can be a minimum or a maximum depending on are you trying to minimize your objective function or maximize your objective function. So he talked about if you have a line and there is a point, it could be two dimensional or three dimensional. If I want to now find the closest point on the line from the, from the point, we are talking about some kind of optimization, right? That means we need to find the minimum distance. So he introduced this word minimum distance back then, long time ago, although he didn't formalize how to find it, but he at least gave a methodology to find it and talked about finding the importance of finding it. Euclid also did a lot of other things regarding optimization, like um, if you have a perimeter specified to you, so in this case, let's say this perimeter is 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 times 4, 16, so 16 units. And you can have um, uh, any rectangle that's perimeter is 16 units. What is the shape that's going to maximize the area? So he talked about specifying something, which now becomes like a constraint, like, so my perimeter is 16 is a constraint. And with that perimeter, I want to now maximize the area inside, and I want to make it a rectangle. These are some um, do's that you have, to, you have to have. What area or what shape? Is it a rectangle? Is it a square? If it's a rectangle, what is the aspect ratio? If it's square, I know the aspect ratio is 1. So what is going to make it having the maximum area? You can formally do it uh, using the optimality methodologies today, but you know that it's going to be a square, right? So here you can see the example. So some of these he talked about with geometry. He played with geometry where optimization is brought in. And that's why I said a little bit of knowledge of geometry will be helpful if you want to understand the optimization methods. Heron talked about light traveling in straight line, right? Light always goes from one point to another point in the minimum possible time. And it has to be a straight line then. But then when you go from one medium to another medium, the, right, the light has to refract. And it does in a way so that in its individual minima, it travels at a fastest speed okay, from one point to the other. And that's how it has to go away from how it started. So that's why there is an incidence angle and there is a refractance angle, which are different because every medium, the light travels in a different way. So if you follow all these things, you can actually come up with Fermat's law. And this is one of the assignment you will have tomorrow, I think, to prove that, uh, that the light will follow the Fermat's law. Then uh, fast forward to 17th and 18th centuries where most of the development has taken place. Uh, there were some nice um, uh, applications that people have done. Kepler, for example, did come up with what, because wine production started around the same time, little earlier than that, but storing of wine was a big thing. Uh, not in this country that much, but particularly in Europe. Um, so they needed to find what are the optimal sizes and shapes of wine barrels so that it stays cool for a long time and still stored uh, in, a, in a better way for a long time. So he helped calculate some of those things using not any formal method again, but uh, the geometry and other, other stuff that uh, the ideas came from the earlier works of people. He also did some non-numeric optimization as, as Professor uh, Das has been talking about. Particularly in an in a evening lecture, he talked about how can you choose a wife? For, uh, that was back in 1611. I was asked this question actually some time ago on a television interview here. Uh, and I was taken out of the context. And uh, he asked me, uh, can I use your algorithm to choose my wife? Uh, I said, that will be dangerous to do. But, then, um, but there are actually some methodologies which you can follow. And, and secretary, they actually this problem is called secretary choice problem, but you can put it to any, anybody that you'd like to choose. So his optimum solution was this, that 36.8% spouses, or, or if you're a man, if you're choosing for a woman, 36.8% uh, of the first, 36.8% of them you reject. Okay, don't, don't select. And then whoever comes first, you should choose. So don't take it and blame me later on for that purpose, but this was Kepler's, Kepler's optimal design, optimal solution to this choice problem. And he, of course, assumed a lot of things that um, the, they can come in any order. There is no specific order they come and all that. So there are, you need to read those fine lines of 
under what assumptions this is optimal. But you know, some such thing is what I also call as rule eventually. So you see what happens. He's trying to solve a particular problem. He first understood what the problem is, and then he posed it like a mathematics problem, and then he finds a solution. Uh, you need to, of course, find, read all the fine prints that I mentioned to you. But then you get a solution that is not contextual, right? It, I just explained to you in Word that first 36.8 percent people you meet don't hire them if you're hiring a secretary, for example. Then the next one comes in for interview, hire them. That seems to have a mathematical property of being an optimum. If you assume they come in certain ways, you need to go back and look at all that. Now, once you found that result, you can now keep it as a rule, as a rule base that this is how I'm going to always choose, right? So that's the knowledge that you get from it because this knowledge comes from not an arbitrary solution but an optimal solution. Okay, so we tr the innovation is sort of like this concept extended in a, in a much more broader sense. We'll get there, but you see, optimal solutions you find for implementing. But if you try to then go and understand, they have a lot of information in them, which can be very, very helpful. So what about like if you are the company who discovered this rule that it works in most cases, obviously you're not going to publicize this, right? You're going to keep it as a trade secret of your, of your company. And this is what I mean by being leader, leader and understanding what is the fundamental behind these optimal solutions. OK, then there are lots of different other people, uh, shape of a hanging chain to uh, gradient becomes zero at the optimum. All these become calculus came up, and then optimization is related to calculus and everything. Koenig came up with a honeycomb um, material choice, the shape of that, and, and Lagrange came up with Lagrangian theorems that we have in, in optimization. So pretty, pretty fast things have evolved after that. Again, coming to 19th century, things become more and more mathematical. Uh, they try to connect one thing to the other, but I guess one of the greatest uh, thing that has happened is the LP solver by Danzig and uh, the linear programming solver, which has helped a lot of companies, a lot of strategic uh, companies. Like it, it, the first time it was used was in the Second World War for resource allocation kind of problem. Kochi came up with the steepest descent concept, which we'll be talking about. Uh, Optimization went into economics, which, which actually saw a lot of Nobel Prizes in the area and uh, applications in finance. Okay. 20th century, of course, these are some few things I'm saying. I cannot fit in everything. But one of the theoretical development, which the whole optimization literature is based on now, is called Karush Kuntakar conditions, KKT theorem, which I'm going to introduce to you. Um, and then, but this is the basic thing what anybody has to understand. Uh, before you know anything about optimization. Uh, but then there are more formal theories that exist, which will not get into that. Every mathematics department in an engineering university or any university will have some people working on mathematical optimization. But their focus can be slightly different from what we'll be doing here. Uh, their focus would be mostly to come up with theorems and proofs uh, for certain classes of problems. Our focus is not that. Our focus is to come up with even an approximate solution. We don't care much about getting to the actual optimal solution. But something close to it will be OK. But how fast can we get there? How can we take care of all these practicalities and all that? So these are some names that I put here. By the way, Karmarkar, you see the name at the end. He was a, he was a student of IIT Mumbai. He was a PGM. He came up with an alternative to simplex method of linear programming. And his method is used for very large scale linear programming problem. He's back to, back to India, he works in Mumbai these days. OK, so there are some uh, Indian contribution as well over here. OK, so with that background, uh, that seems to have a very, very long history and a lot of interest in math area mostly. Uh, we'll now get into some introduction to what is optimization and get into the engineering side of it. So first of all, there are a few things I put there in the first paragraph on red. And these are the things you have to pay attention. So optimization is a task. It's an effort that you have to make for searching a set of decision variables. So you need to first, in a problem, identify what are your decision variables, which would minimize or maximize one or more objective functions. So that means we are talking about some objective functions. And they have to, these variable combinations have to satisfy certain constraint functions as well. So there are three things, decision variables, objective functions, and constraint functions. These are essential 
for formulating an optimization problem. So in, t in today's afternoon <coughs> exercise, there are a couple of problems. You need to identify each one of them for the problems and then write them in mathematical form. Okay, so that is the task. So here I'm showing you a two variable problem. So there are two decision variables, x and y. Okay, this is a hypothetical problem. This doesn't represent any problem. This is just a mathematical problem I'm showing you here. You see the x and y space, right? So x and y space is this space as you see. x is this direction, y is in that direction. So any point in this first quadrant here, I can give you a corresponding x and a y, right? It represents an x and y. Those are the specific values of x and specific values of y. Now that you've told me a specific value, I can actually think of a solution with those values. So x could be the dimension, let's say length of a beam, and, and y could be the diameter of the beam. Okay, so a beam is like a rod. I have, I have a length and I have a diameter. If you give me these two, I can actually visualize. I can actually do a lot of things. I can actually find out how much it will going to weigh because material I've assumed to be fixed, let's say. I can also figure out how much it's going to cost me from the material cost and also maybe I need to turn it in a lead and how much from material to how much I've reduced, it gives me an idea how much it's going to cost me, right? So once, but the solution here is that beam which has two parameters, x and y. If you give me an, one value of x and one value of y, I can fix that design. I can think of how much it's going to cost or how it's going to perform, right? So decision variables specify the design, okay? So x and y in this case are two. And I told you I'm going to show you a result eventually, and that's probably the climax of this course, is where the number of variables have gone to billion, not just two. So I'll obviously not be able to show you. And when three dimensions I can barely show you, but anything more I cannot show you. But most typical problems in practice has 10 plus object variables. So 10 to 50 is pretty common. Anything more than that comes, but as the number of variables increase more and more, they are rare and rare. But 100, 500, 1000 is not very uncommon. But in all our lectures here, I'm going to keep only two variables so that I can show it on two dimensions so you can get the idea. All right, so now after we talked about the variables, the question comes of constraint. So there could be a constraint function like here I'm showing you this ellipse here. So the constraint will say, constraint actually makes this whole region of possible solutions into two classes. One is the feasible class, the other is the infeasible class. In this case, a constraint may, this constraint may say that all the points inside the ellipse are feasible. So that means outside is infeasible, inside is feasible. It could have been the other way around, but that is determined by the problem. And the constraints could be stress constraints, or constraints could be space constraints or whatever. So here, when I showed you the xy first quadrant, that's my search space. That's called the search space. That means I can search anywhere in the first quadrant of x and y why first quadrant? Why not second, third, fourth? Anybody has any clue? Dimensions cannot be negative. Exactly. Dimensions, it's, I've talked to you x is a dimension and y is a dimension. They cannot be negative. That's why you're in first, first quadrant. But there could be another problem where you, you can have negative values. Okay, so in that case, we will have negative. We will have maybe all four, all four quadrants. So it depends on the problem. Um, but that's my search space. Now a constraint comes and says, okay, now that you have this broad search space, not everything is feasible. So the constraints will say, what is feasible? There could be one or more constraints, okay? And every constraint has to be satisfied before you get a feasible solution. So basically, we have to take a union of all the constraint feasible spaces to get the overall feasible spaces. Constraints can be of two types, equality type and inequality type. We'll get to that later. And then the third thing here is the objective function, which you see here as a surface, okay? So any x, y you choose, which is feasible, that means which is inside that uh, ellipse, now I have to know what is the objective function. Let's say I'm trying to minimize this surface, this function. I'm trying to find out what value on that surface is going to give me minimum function value. So any point here, for example, this point here has a function value of this much height, okay? So that's the function that describes, once you give a x and y, I can, the function gives me what is the function value. And I'm trying to minimize and trying to be within the feasible region. So in this particular case, this point here has the minimum height. 
to the surface. So, that is my optimal solution. So, the point O here is the optimal solution, right. And I do not know that beforehand, okay. I have the whole search space to search on. So, an algorithm has to start from somewhere and has to move in iterations and plan of going to reach this optimal point. So, that is the task of any optimization algorithm. But here we are talking about an optimization problem. As soon as you have a problem, which means your f x y is defined, your constraint functions are defined, your x y's are identified and your objective function or constraints are functions of these variables, you have an optima. You have already determined the optima. Only thing is you do not know it. So, when I talk about optimality conditions, these are mathematical conditions applied on these function f and constraint functions to say what needs to be satisfied before you have that optimum. If this point has to satisfy this O has to satisfy some conditions. So, those are optimality conditions, but those are for theory purposes. Uh, you cannot use them in practice, those are optimality conditions. That is why you need to use an algorithm, because theory is difficult to apply. You need to use algorithm to go from something that was arbitrary to near the optimum. Is that clear? Okay. So, then we move to the next slide. Mm, okay, this was the optimum I was talking about. So, now here I am giving you an overall um, sketch of the mathematical nonlinear programming problem. X is usually at the decision variable vector, it is usually n dimensional, n is the number of variables. We are trying to find x star, which is the that O point, the x optimum. It is not at any arbitrary point, it is the optimum point. That is going to minimize f x. So, your job will be to supply what is that f x, because it comes from the problem you are trying to solve. And there can be inequality constraints. Most of the lectures we are going to talk about greater than equal to, but you, you can have less than equal to and you can convert greater than equal to to less than equal to or less than to greater than by multiplying both sides by minus 1, right. So, we could do that. Then there are equality constraints, which has to be exactly satisfied that left hand side should be equal to 0. Uh, these kind of constraints also come in practice. And then sometimes there are variable bounds. Sometimes it says x cannot be less than 0. So, you have a lower bound of 0 or x can be between 2 to 10 for example. So, 2 becomes the lower bound, 10 becomes the upper bound and every variable can have different limits. Some variables you may not know, so you do not have to specify. But this is by far what you get as an optimization problem. If everything is linear here, all the functions f, g, h, then it is called a linear programming problem. Okay? If f x is quadratic, that means it is quadratic, it has maximum x square power and all your constraints are linear then it is called a quadratic programming problem. Now, fortunately, some problems from practice has this kind of pro structured properties. If you see that kind of properties in your problem, you should not think of any other method. You should just go and apply those methods, because those linear programming, quadratic programming methods are geared towards solving those problems specifically. They do not do very good job in solving other problems. But here, in this slide, you see a very generic structure. It is called a nonlinear programming problem. Okay? So, f, g, h can be anything. Let us take an example. Say we have to design a beer can. So, here is a can. I am representing it with two dimensions, h and r. Uh, I could think of lots of lots of other variables, right? Like for example, thickness of the can. Okay? What else can I think of as a variable? Yeah. Okay, we go back. If any of the functions is nonlinear, it is called a nonlinear programming problem. All are linear, it is called a linear programming. Okay? Now, usually the objective functions are more nonlinear than constraints, but there is no such structure. For another problem, it could be the other way. But most problems that, that we solve, objective function is the most complex form of the function, and constraints are usually manageable. Okay? But if any of them is nonlinear, it is a nonlinear programming problem. Okay. Please raise your hand or ask question if you have anything to ask. But uh, here, let us go over it in an interactive mode a little bit. So, I am introdu I'm introducing you to, to the problem. It is a beer can that you have to design and I told you only two variables. So, there are three things you have to identify, right? If you have to optimize this, first is what is my decision, what are my decision variables? So, I mentioned to you H and R. These are the two basic things I need. How much the diameter should be and how much should be the height. So, R instead of diameter, I am calling the radius as a variable 
and height as another variable. Somebody said thickness, or I said thickness is another variable. Thickness of the can, right? What else can you think of as a variable? Material. Material. What makes it aluminum? Is it copper? Is it steel? Okay, that's good. Another? Any other? No, cost is not a variable. You can you can you vary the cost and have a design? No. Uh, so that's it's a good point that you mentioned because variables are usually dimensions or manufacturing units that is completely in your hand. You can change it. Cost becomes an outcome. When I go from maybe uh, aluminum to steel to make the thing, maybe the cost will go up. But cost becomes as a byproduct. But material is what as an input I'm giving. So all the variables are like inputs, like what, what is in my control? What can I do to change the design? Cost I cannot change. Cost will become an outcome. If I change my design, I will see the cost is getting changed. But that's not a variable. Okay, any other? Cost is a constraint. Yeah, cost can be a constraint. You want to say, I don't want to manufacture it by more than 10 bucks, 10 rupees, let's say. So that's your, that comes as a constraint function. But that becomes an upper right hand side of those constraints, that it cannot be more than, or it should be less than equal to 10, so that way. Should but variables. Look at it as an objective, right? no, no, not objective at this point. We are just still talking about variables. So let's see how far can we think. Okay. So Good point. Shape can be a variable. Uh, it need not be always cylindrical. That's, that's how you see all the Coca-Cola cans and all that. But why do you have to restrict ourselves to that? Maybe the optimal design is not that. Or if it is, maybe let the optimization tell us that it, is, has, to be, it has to be a cylindrical can. But that's a good point. So shape could be another thing. Now, as soon as we say shape, how can we describe? Because shape becomes like a non-numeric thing, right? So how can we be more specific about the shape and what are my numeric variables? Huh? Volume again becomes an outcome, right? Once you tell me the shape and dimensions, I can give you the volume. Yeah? Uh, it's a hollow thing because I'll be storing liquid inside. So it's hollow inside. Uh, there are there is a top on the and the base, yes. Right. You are talking about some other shapes of the top and the bottom. Yeah, that could be another variable as well. Yeah, But just for your first uh, thing you said about the shape, how can we describe a shape? So what kind of shape are you thinking of, if not cylindrical? You're always thinking of axis symmetric? Or are you thinking of square? Are you thinking of hexagonal? Well, it's up to you, right? Because you are designing. If you want to explore everything, you have to keep this very generic. If you want to say, no, it has to be axis symmetric because it doesn't matter how you hold it. You can rotate it, and you can hold it still. It would serve the purpose. Then you should make an axis symmetric one. Now, axis symmetric, now what I need? I need an area, and then I can rotate it about the center. So how do I specify the area? It could be any curve. So a curve, it could be a Bezier curve. So I can put some three, four Bezier points, and I can coordinate of those points can become my variables. So you change any of the coordinates, you have a different curve. And one of them will be a straight line, which will give me the circle, uh, give me the cylindrical shape. So that's, that's a way to think about, to make it very generic. Okay? So like that, yeah, you can think of many, many other things. For example, I can add a few other, like uh, what should be the texture of the outside? Yeah, should it be very smooth or rough so that I hold it? Uh, what would be the color? Okay, because that could be another thing which is, if it depends on the objective functions that I have, may not be so important, but you can think of some of those things as well. Uh, could it be like a tapering thing that that should end up to a point, or it should be can be a frustrate? Uh, of course, sorry, it's called a frustrum of a cone. Frustrum, right? So all these things can come in. How? You can go in for about 10 to 12 to 15 different variables, even for this simple problem. But one of the things that I caution is that, yeah, you can think if you really have to do it. Don't just make the problem unnecessarily hard. As you are adding more and more variables, you are making the optimization algorithm work more, right? 
and find out the best design, the optimal design. So it may take more time to optimize. If you don't have to, don't do it. But if you really think, yeah, I need to know once and for all, because every day I design this, I need to know is, is cylinder the right way to do. So yeah, do it once, and then you, are, you have to be prepared to spend, give more time for the optimization algorithm to do it. So come up with as many, as minimum number of variables as possible. So let's say we keep ourselves only to these two variables. Then comes the next question, constraint. So now the constraint, as soon as you've designed the variables, that means all other that you did not take as a variable have to be now fixed to certain value. So one of the things for the shape, I'm going to fix it as a cylindrical. Thickness, I'm going to fix it, let's say, 0.5 mm. Okay, I fixed everything. Color and all that I fixed. Only variable is H and R. You can change H. If you change H longer and higher and higher, you'll get a longish looking cylinder. If you make R longer and longer, you are making a fat kind of a can, right? So that's how they change. Now, what could be some constraints now? So constraints and objective function are now going to be functions of H and R. Other things being constant, so that's going to be function of H and R. So what could be a constraint? Volume, volume inside. You want, somebody said that, or we want at least certain volume inside. So let's say I want 330 milliliter, because that's usually the Coke cans are, OK? So We'll have H and R combination so that the volume inside is 330. So my what type of constraint is that? Is it equality or inequality? Equality. If you want exactly 330, it has to be equality. But is that a requirement? So what would be the constraint? So it will be an inequality, but what kind? So you want volume should be less than or equal to 330? OK, let's discuss that. What if you do less than or equal to, say, say I've got OK, I need to then talk to you about objective function first. OK, so let's hold on the less than equal to and greater than equal to, and we'll come back to that. Now let's talk about objective function. OK, what other constraints there can be? Hmm? Volume is one, of course. What other? Upper and lower limit on the dimensions. Yes, we can definitely. We don't want to make it so thin that I cannot hold it, OK, or so thick that, again, I cannot hold it. Or, but what could be other constraints? Stability could be one thing, right? So you have, if it's too narrow and long, it has a chance of tipping over. And you don't want that to happen. So stability, we can compute where the CG is versus how much can you turn before the CG goes outside the best. And then you lose the stability. So all these, you being the designer of this can, you have to think about all these. OK? Um, OK, so there could be a lot of such constraints that can come in. But let's talk about objective function now. So what could be an objective function? Reduction. Now somebody said cost. That comes in. OK? Now that I have a, I have, I've thought about the, the decision variable and the constraints, what I come up with should minimize, let's say, the cost of fabrication. So cost can be related to the surface area, so how much material I'm putting. So I have a cylindrical area, and then I have two top, right? So I can sum up all this area, and I want to minimize that. That will probably be proportional to the cost. right? So that's my objective function. Let's keep it that way. I can use some other objective function as well. Uh, but now getting back to the less than equal to and greater than equal to for the constraints and on the volume, what if I have this objective function, which is the overall material that I have to put here to be minimized, obviously. right? I don't want to maximize the material I'm putting in. I want to do it with minimum amount of area so that I spend less money. More material, more area means more material means more money, right? So more cost. Now, can you revise? Is it going to be the area, the volume inside should be less than or equal to 330 or greater than or equal to 330? What if you do less than 330? The optimal solution is h equal to 0, r equal to 0, because you don't have a can. You don't spend any money, and nobody can beat that, right? But then I have not achieved anything. It's a trivial, we call it a trivial solution. Oftentimes we get into this trivial solution. That means you have not gone and put a very crucial constraint if that kind of solution comes up. OK, so then you have to go and see what constraint it's, it's that I didn't put. OK, so it has to be greater than or equal to 300, 30, 330, OK? So this is how you formulate a problem. So here is the mathematical formulation. Uh, I mentioned some of the other things that you may want to use as variables or parameters. In this case, we choose the diameter and height. I have chosen aluminum with some thickness. And the constraint function is shown here, right? 
the G function is given here. You see the volume here has to be greater than or equal to 330. And the objective function is the pi dh, which is the, which is the cylindrical area, plus 2 times pi d squared by 4, which are the two top and the bottom lead. right? And then I put some variable bounds on each of the diameter and the height to make it more reasonable. So once you specify like this, now you have formulated the optimization problem. Now I can go and use an algorithm to give me d star and h star, starting from any arbitrary solution. Okay, so that's the job of the algorithm. Don't try to think of yourself, what is the d and h? But it's the algorithm's job to find it. Your job is to formulate the problem so that every constraint, valid constraint that are needed are here. Now, you can help the algorithm by many ways. First thing, as I said, reduce the number of variables as low as possible without sacrificing on the complexity of the problem. Second thing is, every optimization algorithm requires you to supply at least one starting point. If you have some knowledge, let's say there is an existing can available in the market and you want to improve on it, right? You can measure those dimensions and provide that as an initial solution rather than an arbitrary solution, right? And then the algorithm will starting already from a good solution. It will take less time or less iterations to get to the optimum, okay? So we'll talk about algorithms not today, but we are today talking about only problem formulations. Yeah. Yeah. So if your objective function and constraints are not functions of a particular variable, okay, like for example, I used what color I'm going to put on the can, and my cost is let's say it doesn't matter, every color costs me the same. So my cost does that variable doesn't appear on either of my constraints or my objective function. You can put anything there, so it's not so you have a free ride there. You can choose anything. The fact that you have chosen that as a variable, somehow it should reflect in your objective function and constraints. So if not, you can come back and delete that, cut that off as a variable. Okay? That's, not gonna That's not going to affect the final thing. But um, sometimes it's tricky. Sometimes the objective functions may have less number of variables than what you have considered. But those variables which do not appear in the objective function appears in the constraint function. Okay, then that problem, that variable is also important because it determines whether a solution is feasible or not. And I showed you in the very first slide that the constraints actually chops up certain part of the search region, so it's important. So constraint satisfaction is the first most important thing in optimization. You cannot give me a solution that is outside this feasible region. The fact that I told you 330 milliliter is needed, if you give me a design with 250 milliliter inside, I cannot take your design. I cannot then fabricate it, right? No matter how low it cost me, I cannot because I wanted to have at least 330 milliliter. So constraint satisfaction is the most important part. And if some variables are involved in that and not doesn't appear in objective function, it's fine. It's still, that is an important thing. Um, algorithms work in this way that you start with. So once these constraint surfaces are identified in your, so this is again a two variable kind of sketch I'm talking about. You start with the initial guess. And then as soon as you've used the algorithm, the algorithm has a way to determine which direction to search from that point. So from this point here, uh, this point here, it goes in that direction and finds the best point. Okay? It doesn't search in all n-dimensional space now. It's only searched in that direction. And then that's the end of one iteration. Next iteration, now that you're here, the algorithm says go in that direction, and you will go and find the best point along that. This is how you continue before you come, come close to the optimum. Now, you may wonder, why didn't it take the shortcut and come here, like going this way? That's something to do with the algorithm. Algorithm was designed not for a particular problem. It was a generic algorithm, maybe with gradient information, maybe with some other information, locally speaking, along that initial, around that initial guess. And that turned out to be the best direction the algorithm suggests, so you have to follow this. So as soon as you're using somebody else's algorithm, you don't have too much freedom. You just have to follow that. But you have the freedom to blame it at the end. Say, oh, it's not a good method okay, for my problem. But you change your problem to another problem. Maybe that algorithm is the best one now, because whoever has designed it probably had this kind of problem in mind. 
that's where the NFL, the no freelance theorem comes in, which we'll get into. But you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, all these are there. We'll talk about the algorithms tomorrow, okay, how it depends on the gradient, yeah. But here I'm talking you the principles of optimization. This is point-based, the principles of point-based optimization methods. You start with a point, algorithm suggests which way to go and how much to go. As soon as you got that, that's the end of one iteration. Then the algorithm says, now that you're here, go in this direction. This is the best direction. And you go again. So you repeatedly use this method eventually hope of coming close to the optimum, right? Okay, now let's go through a list of problems that are found in practice, which are optimization type. First and foremost are the design and manufacturing problems, okay? Uh, so you can see here various types of design problems I've showed you, a, a cab design, a gearbox design, a airplane wing design, for example, a VLSI design. There are it doesn't matter which field you come, you always have to do design. Design must have been a course in your undergraduate, right? no matter what field you come from. And a design involves a lot of parameters. Any of these things, now with this knowledge, you can identify some parameters right, as variables, which you can change. And for example, in the gearbox, how many gears? What is the gear thickness? What is the material? What is the module of the gear? How many gear tooth? So many things I could do, how they should be arranged. What is the objective? Objective function would be, the size of the whole gearbox. I want to make it as compact as possible. Another objective could be I want to have a gearbox that can transmit a maximum number, maximum power. So that means my gear sizes are going to be very thick so that it, can, it doesn't break and can transmit lots of power. So different kinds of objectives. Constraints, I want certain variable speeds at the output, right? I give an input speed, I want certain speeds at the output shaft. Am I getting that? If I don't get that, this gearbox doesn't serve it. Like when in your car, when you change gears, it gets certain speed, right? So I want that kind of stuff, right? So no matter which, which one you take, you can come up with now variables and constraints and objective functions, okay? Now, how do you write this as a mathematical formulation comes from the knowledge of that particular field. So if you're a mechanical engineer, you have done a course on gearing, how, how these things are calculated, the gears, the speed, the thicknesses and all these, the gear design, you must have gone through a half a semester course on that or maybe one month on that. Nobody else can do that, okay? So you are the expert in that field, so that's why optimization always needs an expert from the field to provide us these mathematical objective function and constraints. A, a person who is an expert in biology will not be able to do that, okay? So because you are solving a niche problem from your own field, you have to come up with these things. And that's not an easy effort. That takes about, I would say, 50 to 60% of the whole optimization effort. You have to go back to design gear books, to your mechanics books, mostly to your undergraduate material. That's why I think optimization has to be used with at least an undergraduate background from the field. But certain problems can be easy if you're doing uh, finance problems or uh, geometric kind of optimization problems. Oftentimes, we need to do that then of course you don't need too much knowledge. Here are some examples, I'm not going to go through each of them, uh, but those of you who are in civil engineering or mechanical engineering, working on structural optimization or structure design area, this is a very simple truss, you can go through the stresses that comes through, the objective function is the weight of the whole thing to be minimized, and the, the constraints come from the stresses at every member should not be more than the strength of the material, and there are some restrictions on the sizes so here the cross-sectional sizes are the variables. You can have a car design, the suspension design, where there are some suspension parameters, the damper characteristics and the stiffener characteristics, those are your variables. The constraint would be that, um, that certain, for example, the, um, uh, one of the problems we solved using this is, there's a concept called jark, which is the change of acceleration. Okay, that tells you how comfortable the ride is, but there are some ISO charts which, which describes what is a comfortable ride. So you want to design this suspension so that the ride is comfortable and you can specify certain limit on that. Uh, then the objective function can be that the road undulation get transmitted to the passengers moving around with the road as minimum as possible. Although you're going through a big hump, 
but passenger is not following the hump. Okay, <laughs> there is less uh, less uh, variation or uh, or displacements that the that the user have. So different kind of thing you can think of. So these are one kinds of problems. Manufacturing area also, if you're trying to do, let's say, the best operation of a lathe or of a particular milling machine. So there are a lot of parameters like feeding, speed, uh, rotation, all these different stuff. So you want to design those things so that you have a very smooth cut or you cut it at the minimum possible time. All these could be your objective functions, right? Switching gear a little bit, there are lots of problems in practice which are inverse type. Okay, there is actually a whole field uh, called uh, inverse engineering or inverse problem solving. There is a conference I know completely dedicated to this. Um, the other names for this in mechanical engineering called tomography. I don't know whether you had exposure in any of your courses on tomography, but these are like non-destructive testing. So um, one other thing would be, let's say, if you take a plate, I think I have an example here. Yeah, um, this is a plate and without cutting the plate and figuring out if there is a fault or if there's a crack somewhere, uh, what you could do is you can put some actuator at certain places in the plate and have some receiver at the other end and, and note down the time of travel of an ultrasonic wave or any kind of wave that you can send. If you have a parent material which doesn't, which is let's say notch free or any crack free parent material, you know how much time it takes, right? Uh, so the difference between these two times in the actual prototype versus the original one can tell you where the crack is, if there is a crack, what the shape is like. So what you have to do is you've got to have lots of different places where you put the actuators and lots of different places you put the sensors. So when you're measuring all these rays and times, put all of them together in an algorithmic way, you can actually predict how the crack is if there is a crack. So there was a PhD student of mine who worked on this and we could predict really the whole shape of the crack by doing by by non-destructive way of, of doing it. I mean, we are not cutting across anything; we're just measuring the time and figuring out what is inside. So these are called inverse problem. Now, why is it inverse? Because to an academic institute or in a course, what we do is to the students we give this course as a as a this is a problem. Like I give you a plate and I tell you there is a crack of this nature somewhere in the middle. I give you the exact, let's say there is a hairline crack, I give you, and I tell you if I put an actuator at this point and I put a sensor at that point, how much time it will take for the ray to travel? That's a good problem. It's called a forward problem because now you have a system, there is an input, and I want to find out the output. So this is like a system approach that we often teach in, in engineering and in, and in sciences. This is called forward problem solving. But the problem I just posed is an inverse one, right? I don't know what the crack is, if there is a crack or whether how 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 is the shape. I want I tell you the numbers when it reaches there from here to there. So I gave you the output and I want to tell you what caused it. Now these kinds of problems are called inverse problems. These are called tomography problem and oftentimes you have that from brain images or many of those things. These are also one of the ways to solve this problem is through optimization. So one of the things that come in these problems is that there are many, many solutions that will fit in to this time thing that I've talked to you about. So then there is one constraint that comes in. It's called the Occam's razor. What actually means is the simplest looking shape, the simplest looking object. So there could be a solution with all these times I gave you. There's a crack here, there's a crack here, there's a crack there and all there that matches all the time you gave me. Also, there is another solution with a small crack somewhere else in a slightly inclined manner. That also matches all the numbers that you gave me. Okay. So the constraint should say, take the simplest one, take that one crack. Instead. So most likely that one has taken place. So again, we don't know, but we often go with these hunches. But in solving such problems, multimodality comes in, which I mentioned that we find multiple solutions. So this is one problem where you need to find multiple solutions and then argue and see which is possible and which is not. Because when you're solving this as an inverse problem, you are actually solving numerically the problem. It doesn't understand the context, so it can give you all possible solutions. Some of them may make sense, some of them may not make sense. If you know that, you can put those information as a constraint. If you don't know that, then you can later on make the decision. Okay, any question? You have a question? What is the rate of the 
Rate of success. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, when you when you know your material well, uh, it's a very good success we could do. But if your material also is unknown, that means if you tell me there is only crack, I'm interested, or there is only crack in this thing that I can expect, then it's a two material thing. One is the actual material, the other is air, or vacuum, whatever it is, right? So that's a very not a very difficult problem to solve. But now if you say there could be inserts of different kinds, which also I want to understand. Now the insert material I don't know, right? And that's all going to change my time of travel. And your insert material is also as a variable. Now I'm increasing my number of variables. That's a difficult problem. Because there'll be many, many combinations of shape and the material which is going to match your time. And that becomes an open, open problem. Yeah, composite would be a difficult problem to solve because you may expect number of different materials over there. Right. Yeah, so there are limited applications of this. Only thing is that the optimization algorithm needs more time when you have more variables. So if you have computing power and time to use it, then you can eventually get there. Yeah, but yeah, that's a that's a bit of caution that you have to have here. Okay. The other problems are parameter estimation. Uh, all of you have used uh, regression, right? A linear fit through a set of data. You do experiments in a lab. You know that it has to come as a straight line. You call a software, right? And the software gives you the line. You know that the software has used an optimization method. It's a least square optimization, yeah. So that's a way to, that's the, that's the only way to get there. What it does is it comes up with a line for which the Perpendicular distances from each of the point to the line is minimum if you take an average of all that. Now, tomorrow, you have another set of data points. You're not expecting a line. You're expecting, let's say, a curve. Let's say a periodic curve. You can't use that particular software because that was specifically designed for linear feet. But now that you know there is an optimization method inside, you can come up with your own optimization method with the periodic curve that you're expecting, right? So the basic principle is that an optimization method is used. You can use it for any other regression fit. Okay. The other kinds of problem that comes in in design of experiments uh, problems. Uh, some of the experiments in biology or even in physics can be very, very expensive. To set up the whole thing requires a lot of money and effort. And then you do the experiments to get some data. Or you do computer simulations. And sometimes it takes days to get a data, particularly if you're using CFD and other things. Um, so let's say you've got 100 data points evaluated. You are trying to get a, um, a meta model of your surface so that you know where the good things are. You've got 100 points. You are looking for 101st point. Now, are you going to do, are you going to create that 101st point at random? Probably not, because 100 point gives you a very good idea of the surface. And those 100 points can then give you an idea where to put the next point so that you get maximum information out of the function you're trying to model, right? So there is a d-optimality, g-optimality, all these different concepts that are there in design of experiments that uses optimization. So you have some knowledge of some points. You want to create, where shall I put the next experiment? Because every experiment is expensive. So that's where you can use optimization methods. OK, switching gear again. Modeling, it's another big area of optimization. This is a sketch of a blast furnace. Uh, where there are a lot of inputs that come to the furnace. And then after a few hours of operation, you get output, which is the molten iron. Then you go and see the strength of that molten iron. Now, the strength is a function of all those inputs. You want to understand what is the input-output relationships. Now, steel has been produced for more than 100 years, right? Now, um, they still don't know exactly what goes on. There are a lot of stuff they understand zone-wise, but these are all quite, you know, a lot of assumptions are put in that this is this zone, that is that zone. There are some mushy areas which they are not very clear. But have they stopped them producing steel? No. They still produce steel and we make, make bridges and buildings with it and still live on them or go over them, right? Uh, they work most of the time. But if you think of understanding steel, is there any metallurgist here from metallurgy? Nobody? OK. So they can tell us better. But, but I have worked with metallurgists just like a few years ago. 
at that point, even they, they were not sure. I'm not sure if in a couple of years anything has happened. But what they know is that there are a lot of equations like this that you see on the top here, which are known. Maybe zone-wise, maybe some general form of the reaction that takes place, and we can figure out. But they cannot trust them that that's exactly what's going on in practice, because there are sort of a lot of uncertainties in them. Ambient temperature, the, the, the operator's mood, OK? It also depends on how much air he let in and all that. It all depends on that. These are sometimes you cannot describe. So what they do is they modify these equations by multiplying with those Greek letters. As you see, gamma, beta, all these they have. Those actually don't exist in the actual equations. But they add those things. Those becomes your variables of the optimization problem. Now you say, OK, I am, to, I am going to now find out what values I should put as gamma, alpha, beta, all these, so that the output from these equations matches closely with the plant output. Because you usually have plant output for many, many years. Now you are trying to model that system. So you're trying to find, how am I going to modify my equations so that my output of the equation matches well with the input? Now these kinds of systems are very good for interpolations. Okay, or it doesn't work very well for extrapolations. But by all you're doing is, you have, if you have lots of data and you are trying to do an interpolative model, this is a good way to do it. So it's an optimization. So you find alpha, beta, gamma through optimization of minimizing the error. Another thing, which I don't know how many of you know, artificial neural network. Uh, I'm sure in this campus there's some people talk about or teach about these courses. So this is another way of getting input-output relationships between inputs and outputs, relationships. But in neural net, you don't get the relationships as mathematical functions like you will get in the, in the first case I talked about. But your relationships get, in an abstract way, it gets stored, it gets learned. But you know that the neural network process of learning the, the weights of the neural network uses an optimization method. So either you use the first one or the top one or the bottom one Optimization is at the core, telling you how to set it, how to get the relationships for modeling purposes. So I've got some examples here. The fourth class of problems where you get into or use optimization, again, a large way is scheduling and routing and planning and some of these things. Classroom scheduling, for example. In this campus, there are so many classes, few classrooms, few teachers, few, few days in a week, right, you are teaching. And somebody has to make that roster, right, so that not one student is sitting in two different classes at the same time, right? So this will be a constraint which is not allowed to be violated. Similarly, two courses cannot be taught in the same room at the same time, right? All these different constraints will come in. We tried to formulate this for IIT Kanpur one time with an IMS student that I had. So many constraints that come in, it's very difficult to find even one feasible solution from scratch. So we had to use some very good solutions, which are the existing solutions now. And then our algorithm was able to modify on it and come up with a much better solution. So sometimes you have to do it. So these problems are very, very difficult than the problems we talked about so far. So traveling salesperson is one such problem, where if salesperson has to travel various cities to sell some product, how shall he plan so that there is no crisscrossing? An objective function in such problem is to minimize the overall distance traveled. Other kinds of problems, optimization comes in called optimal control, that some of you have taken a course on control, right? Um, these are the variables in these problems are not just these dimensions that I have mentioned. Uh, this is a profile, usually. So it could be that you are controlling, let's say, a nuclear power plant, OK? Very important application. So there are certain places you have a pressure gauge, you have a volume, a volume flow measuring gauge and temperature gauge and all that stuff. These are your control stuff. You can control them, right? So you see that now you have to have an idea that over time, how shall my pressure be controlled? Or how shall I set my pressure? How shall I set my temperature inside that reactor? OK? So you will get some kind of a profile here, as you see on the left plot here. You can have a profile. And this could be just the temperature as a function of time at a particular place. If you maintain such a pressure temperature distribution, you get the optimal performance. You get the maximum output of something. So we did one such problem with Tata Steel, where they had a furnace. Um, 
and the furnace was was actually taking a lot of fuel to maintain the temperature. They were interested in me coming up with the optimal temperature setting. So the blooms are passed from one side of the furnace, and it goes at a very slow speed with a conveyor belt. And during that process, it's getting heated up. And at the end, they want the temperature anywhere to be at least 1,350 with plus minus something given 10, 10 degrees or 25 degrees. They want a the uniform uh, temperature all along with minimum scale in them. So now there are three burners. So we need to figure out how shall we maintain the temperature through those three burners across the furnace so that I need to supply minimum amount of heat and also have that temperature set up. OK, so these are called control problems. Uh, I will introduce you to more control problems later. Uh, Here is the crane maneuvering, which I will talk about later. The other kinds of problems are in finance, for example, forecasting and predictions. There are a lot of companies these days who are trained in optimization area, open up. Some of the PhD students that I have, I had in the past, one of them had opened such a company. One of my colleagues, that I, when I was doing PhD, he was also doing his PhD. And Eventually, he opened up a, a, you know, such a forecasting company. So what you do is, these companies, they have lots of data about the market, OK? Um, how much, how they're doing for the last few years. And they always make a model of that. And I talked about the modeling aspect through optimization. If their modeling is good, they can predict it better, maybe for a week, maybe for a month, maybe for a year. It depends on how good is the model. And then if you go for saving your money, all these portfolio managers, right? Uh, all these saving companies that you have, that's what they do. They actually invest your money, some amount to this bond, some amount in that bond, so that at the end of a year, they give you a maximum gain. Okay, if they can give you, then you will keep, keep your money with them for a longer time. So that's how they earn money. But the way you forecast it well, then you can, I'm sorry, the, the model it well, you can predict what goes on in the future. So that's, a, that's an optimization problem of making a good model so that you can forecast well. The other big application of optimization over the years have come is weather forecast, weather forecasting. Weather these days can be predicted so well. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen some of the hurricanes move through US. Um, they predict so well um, these days because they have a global model and they have this optimization at the core, which, which is they have a lot of weather stations and weather recording station at various places in the, in the globe. And they're constantly getting data, not only over Earth, but also in the, in the sky. They're constantly getting data. And all they are doing is they are adjusting their model so that the output from their model matches with the data that they're constantly getting. It's a continual process. OK, now if the hurricane develops, all they have to do is predict with that model how the hurricane is going to go, which way it's going to go. So you observe that they show you up to current point with one solid line, how it has come, because these are all determined now. And from there on, there is a little fuzzy thing. There will be a line, which is the median. Then there will be a 25 percentile, 50 percentile, and 75 percentile, and all that. That says with how much confidence they can tell that it's going to be deviating from the median. And as it's moving, these things also move. So there are a lot of sophistication these days. Some of the softwares, which these weather station will tell you, uh, can reduce. So any model that has the 75 percentile lines are very close to the median means they are predicting well. Okay? If you have a large variance, that means I can even do that. I can even say that over a 200 mile long, this is how it's going to go. But if you can do it with 20 miles, 50 miles range, then you can evacuate those people, right? So with minimum hazard. So a lot of these things, optimization these days has direct social implications. And, and this is something which I'm very hopeful about, that optimization is now getting into social applications to first responder systems, uh, you know, how the first responder should, should uh, respond when a disaster has taken place, OK? Uh, which, which people to evacuate first? which hospitals to take people first, and so on and so forth. These are not any arbitrary um, or you know, just when it happens, you use your intelligence and do it. You have to plan it. Uh, if you see that, OK, for example, New York, there are plans. They were already done. Uh, because there are first time when there was a gas leak inside a tube, inside a, one of those uh, ground, uh, underground metros. 
uh, they have figured out some key stations. If there is a gas leak, so many people at the office time are going to get affected. And where shall they put? Do they have adequate hospitals, first of all, near that? If not, if they have to put two hospitals and two fire stations, where is the best place to put it? So that if disasters happen at these, these critical locations, very quickly they can evacuate and with minimal loss. You know. So these are, again, optimization problems which you plan ahead, not when it happens, before. So put your money, put your resources at the right place. So all these becomes now important, and, and some of these methods can go over there. Other thing in today's world is big data. You may have heard, right? It's, it's a big buzzword these days. Everybody is working on big data. Data comes from various sources. First thing you need to do is classify data, saying, OK, this data coming from there, that data coming from here are basically the same thing. So we got to put them in one class. So how do you make these things? You see here, I'm showing you some umbrellas type of thing is to identify that when data is coming from various places. Once you've done that, now you can look at each class and figure out some other things. So pattern recognition, for example, is another thing. So some of these problems are called machine learning problems. You may have heard through other ways. Uh, it's a part of AI, artificial intelligence. But one of the key methodologies at the core is optimization methods. For any of these words that I've said, Optimization is a way to solve them. OK. Last but not the least is the machine learning applied to is the robotics. This application actually came from Dilip's work. After Dilip has done, I had another student who really applied some of his concepts into this robot. And one of the things that happen in the robotics area is you don't know where the obstacles are going to be when you are navigating. If you know that, it becomes a simple problem. It's a static problem, but these in dynamic situations, you don't know. So then how can you still s solve the problem in an optimal manner? right? So you need to come up with uh, a robot's brain, basically. We came up with a fuzzy rule base by which you can throw the robot in such an environment, and it will have a sensor to know where the obstacles are and make its own decision of how to avoid them. But you are providing the brain. So you do an offline optimization of finding out if many situations like that had happened, what is the optimal solution in terms of a rule base. And this is exactly what I mentioned before about child becoming an adult. It's an optimization process is that. We actually work with rule bases, patterns, that we have seen all these are stored in our nerve system, in our brain, in our brain actually, where they're looking for patterns. So if we see there's a fire, first time I put my hand probably when I was little, and I, I, I get a burning sensation. It says, this is not something to be done. So that's a negative feedback I get. And it gets somehow into my neural net, in my network system that I have in my brain, right? And then something that I enjoy doing, it also stored in a positive way. And later on, if I face with a similar thing, my brain tells me what to do. So it's a growing up process. But the example I gave is that if, let's say, there are a lot of people here, and I put a child here, and I ask the child, to leave the room, and let's say there are not static objects, there are objects that are moving around. Okay? The child will take an object coming to him or her seriously, and we will just try to avoid as much as possible from the object. But the adult solves in a different way. Adults know there, there is the door. So if there's an object coming this way, let's say it's coming this way, and by the time I'm approaching it, I've already crossed it, let's say, because its speed is a little slow. But I know it's coming to me, but I don't care, because by the time I've gone towards my door, it is already behind me, right? So, But that the child doesn't know. It looks at something coming to it. It just tries to go in another direction, right? Because it doesn't have the experience. So when you start an optimization algorithm, you see solutions behaving that way. So when you're developing such a thing, it will just go, when it sees one obstacle, it just goes 90 degrees away from it, OK? But it has to be a specified that you start from here and go and reach that point. But it doesn't obey that. But soon, the solutions come in a more matured way that it doesn't avoid if it doesn't have to. It just keeps that direction. So there is a lot, lot of things to learn when you actually implement an optimization algorithm to a system like this, which is dynamically evolving. You can learn the whole system of how to solve things in a better way, in a more matured way. OK, so I'm almost there at 12. So uh, I'll stop in two minutes. But if you look at all these different problems, um, 
you can't expect, I mean, these are not the all problems, but I've just showed you some of the things that I faced or I know that you have to use optimization. You can't assume the respective objective function and constraints to be differentiable or, dis or continuous. There will be discontinuities, discreteness in the search space. Variables are going to be mixed, like we talked about some variables being continuous, the dimensions can take any value, and some things being discrete, like, for example, I may have two or three options. I may have aluminum, copper, and iron. Maybe these are the three things for my can. Okay? So only three options. On the other hand, the height can be any number. Give me any real number, I can do it, maybe. Okay? So there can be mixed nature of such variables. And unfortunately, the optimization algorithms are not very good when you have mixed kinds of variables. Uh, and there can be large dimensions in many of these problems. Nonlinearity in constraints, multimodality, multi-objectivity, all these we talked about. Uncertainty I have not talked about yet, but um, many problems are uncertain, many variables are uncertain. Which Uncertain means that you specify a value, but you cannot adhere to it in practice. In practice, you will get slightly different value, like the material. Uh, we may take the material value to be, let's say, 200 megapascal, which is the strength, but you go and buy from the market, you will not get exactly 200. There will be plus, minus something. That causes a lot of havoc into the system. I think there's something coming up there. Um, then many of these become computationally expensive, like a CFD solver, for example. We are solving some problem where one optimization takes about a couple of days to run. Okay, so you, r you give the run today, only two days later you come and see the result. That's because every evaluation takes few minutes. And in optimization, you need to evaluate at least few hundreds, few thousand solutions. So if in one or two minutes, one evaluation takes, you can easily go into a couple of days. And uh, so we are trying to solve it through software and hardware both ways, this problem. But this is a problem that's not because algorithms are slow. It's because just the computation is so expensive. And you can't make a shortcut of that because if you try to make too easy by using very few elements in your finite element, uh, a time step you use very small, you don't capture the mechanics or, or the dynamics of the problem. So you can't make it too simple. Other things are multidisciplinary. Uh, this is kind of another area now. We're kind of stabilized now, but I would say 10, 15 years ago, this has been the main thing. Uh, where everything has to be considered from a multiple discipline. Like, for example, uh, aerospace wing, right? Um, it has to be considered from vibration point of view, should not break. It has to be considered from aerodynamics point of view so that we get lift, okay? So it has to be considered from the weight point of view because the whole aircraft has to be light, uh, life, everything. So uh, not one person can be an expert in all these different areas. That's why we have aerospace engineering, we have mechanical engineering, we have structural engineering, and all that different things. So now, for designing one thing, you need to involve lots of different people, okay? lots of different disciplines. Each of the discipline has their own objective functions and constraints and variables. So when you put everything together, there can be hundreds of variables and you know, tens of objectives and constraints. So it becomes a huge problem. The difficulty is you can get them together. Maybe there is a fast algorithm you can use. But when you ch start changing everything, some department says, hey, 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 you can't change that. Okay, I, I can only be between this and this. But it also depends on what you are doing. Okay, so there are a lot of linking between. And there is a hierarchy in those industries. First, for example, in a car I know. First, the axle to axle distance have to be determined before you do the cab. Okay, it doesn't make sense to do a cab and then say, hey, we designed the cab. Now it goes to the axle to axle or wheel to wheel to figure out what should be that. No, they have to design that first and based on the engine power and the weight that has to be carried. Cab is the last thing. So there is a hierarchy. So when there is a hierarchy, you have to maintain that in your optimization as well. So this multidisciplinary optimization is more like a fancy thing where you have various different disciplines. All you are doing is breaking the problem into discipline-wise and trying to make a schedule, that which one I should start, how shall I interact with them. So there is not much in the optimization there, it's more of the scheduling, but, but it's all integrated, okay? All right, so I'm going to stop here for today. Uh, I think this much information is enough for you to solve the assignment problem in the afternoon that I have, so just look at that, it should be there. 
behind, yeah. Um, yeah, the first one, it's on page 168. So we are going to be solving these two problems. Try to read before you come. Uh, so as I said, only today we're going to meet at 3. Uh, other days we'll meet at 2. So if you have any quick question, I can look at that. Otherwise, we meet at 3. Yeah. Yeah. That means your objective function is, no, is not differentiable. Uh, there is no derivative that exists. So let's say there is a mod function you have, or there is a discrete function. X and Y are discrete values it can take. So there is no derivative for discrete variables. You can numerically also you cannot do when you have discreteness, right? Because the next one is far away. And for the numerical gradient to be close to the actual gradient, your h should be very small. Your difference between two should be small. But if your next one is far away, you can compute it, but it may not make any sense. But there are certain problems like, like um, for example, the, the mod function. Uh, even numerical gradient will give you wrong information. So yeah, there are certain difficulties with uh, non-differentiable problems in optimization. Sorry? Mixed, I mentioned uh, some of the variables are continuous, some of the variables are discrete, and together they describe the problem. Like I mentioned, the diameter and height can be real, continuous variable, but thickness, if that's my variable, it can come at a step of 0.1 millimeter, let's say. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, nothing in between. So then it's a combination of real and discrete. That's called mismixed. Yeah, those will come as discrete. So if those are your variables, those will come as discrete. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so those are mixed, those are discrete variables. Yeah. So uh, you mixed variables, I didn't mention that. Permutation is uh, arrangement of some numbers. For example, the travel in salesperson problem. Let's say you have 10 cities you want to travel. Name the cities as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 10. Now, one of your solution is, where shall we start? Where do you go next? Where do you go next? So one solution would be 5 to 2 to 3 to 1 to 4 to 10, like that. You know. So you, you write a series of numbers, each number appearing only once, so that every number appears. And there will be 10 numbers in the case of 10 city problems. So that's a permutation. When you go to another solution, it's just another ordering of these numbers. So these are numbers, but the actual value of the number doesn't make any sense. It's the order which is important. Is the it's a sequence of numbers. So they are, which number is coming after what number? That's important. Then the actual location of these yes. numbers. So are you going to 2 from 5, city 2 to city 5, or you are going to city 3 from city 5? That's the important thing. Not when is this happening? This can happen early on. This can happen later on in your permutation, but is the order that is important. So it's a different kind of problem. These kinds of pro uh, variables come in scheduling and planning that kind of uh, problems. The randomization, is no, no. Randomization is a way to get a random solution. But permutation is a completely different kinds of variables. Yeah, yeah, you have to generate it randomly like that. But then the permutation is not an effect of randomization. This is a randomization is a way to create the permutation. But permutation has some constraints, is that every number has to come only once. OK, not more. So you cannot have two appearing twice in your whole string, right? Last question. Say it again. Say it again. Uh, guarantees part I'm going to talk about next, probably tomorrow. Uh, but very few algorithms guarantee finding the optimum. It, you know, finally, you have linear and quadratic problem. The point-based methods have some guaranteed algorithms, certain guaranteed algorithm for certain class of problems. Population-based also has some guaranteed algorithms for certain types of problems. But they are so, yeah. No, then you cannot guarantee. Yeah. Kind of guarantee. So guaranteed solutions, algorithms for finding guaranteed solutions are very, very few. And the problems are also so much rare in practice 
that even if you don't know them, it doesn't going to matter to you. So most cases, we don't have guaranteed algorithms. Okay, but those algorithms are pretty good at giving you a near optimal solution. So that's what we engineers are often happy with. But from a mathematics point of view, they may not be so good. Okay, I need to stop now uh, and then hold your questions. Maybe for the afternoon, we can spend some time talking about those before we get to the uh, exercise problem. Okay, thank you. <laughs>